My name is Seth Brugman. I'm an associate professor of history at Temple University, uh, and I direct Temple's Center for Public History. Uh, and for the last few years, I've been researching and writing the administrative history of Boston National Historical Park. Doing administrative history is, is really a tricky business. The goal is to figure out how and why parks get made, and then understand how their managers have dealt with all the various challenges uh, that pop up in the life of every MPS unit. What makes it really tricky is that every unit has its own folklore. So everyone who works in a park thinks they know how it got made or what its biggest problems are, or, you know, why so-and-so got fired and someone else got promoted and, and so on and so on. Often those stories have a lot of truth to them. But dig a little deeper and look at things from different perspectives and you'll find that there's complexity in every park story. That's what doing history is all about. It's about sifting through the complexity and figuring out what it tells us about the challenges that, uh, that we face today. So by far the hardest part of writing this administrative history uh, was really understanding how Boston National Historical Park got made. Uh, we all know, of course, um, you know, that Congress authorized the park in 1974, but no unit is ever cut straight from whole cloth. Uh, where, I wonder, did the idea for this park come from? Uh, and whose idea was it in the first place? I determined uh, through my research that the park really emerged from a confluence uh, of at least three paths to authorization. The park as we know it today really bears the marks uh, of all of those paths, and so it's important that we understand them uh, so that we can understand why the park presents the past the way it does. The first path, uh, as it were, began in 1938. It was that year when U.S. Representative John W. McCormick approached a young National Park Service historian named Edwin Small about the possibility of convincing the federal government to make the Dorchester Heights Monument a national monument under federal ownership. Now, Dorchester Heights, the monument there, uh, had been built in 1898 to commemorate the evacuation of British troops from the city after the Siege of Boston uh, back in 1776. For years, Bostonians celebrated uh, the anniversary of the evacuation every March 17th with a big parade and festivities at the monument. And because South Boston was a majority Irish neighborhood, and because March 17th is also St. Patrick's Day, Evacuation Day turned into a huge party. Nonetheless, Edwin Small wasn't very interested in the idea of a national monument there. In his opinion, and I'm quoting, Dorchester Heights just didn't make very much difference in the final outcome of the siege of Boston. But McCormick pushed hard. Um, after World War II, when it appeared that the NPS still didn't want to enact his plan uh, at Dorchester Heights, uh, McCormick just upped the ante. Uh, in 1951, he wrote the legislation that created the Federal Commission uh, that would go on to investigate the possibility of creating a national park encompassing all of Boston's revolutionary history sites. So in other words, uh, since he couldn't get a national monument in Dorchester Heights, he tried to make the whole city uh, into a national monument. And it worked. But why was McCormick so excited about Dorchester Heights uh, in the first place? We can find some clues in his background. He was, uh, for instance, a huge proponent of the New Deal and was really eager to help the National Park Service expand its mission after the passing of the 1935 National Historic Sites Act. McCormick was also really worried about the spread of fascism in Europe and elsewhere. National monuments, he thought, were important defenses against supposed threats to democracy back home. And beyond all that, McCormick grew up in South Boston, just blocks from the monument, 
He even had a notorious street fighting, bootlegging older brother nicknamed Nako McCormick, <laughs> who for years served as Grand Marshal of, yeah, you guessed it, the annual evacuation St. Patrick's Day Parade. And here's where we get to something truly remarkable about 1938. It was that same year that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts officially declared March 17 as Evacuation Day. It was the same year, that is, that Massachusetts legally bound up the Irish heritage of St. Patrick's Day with the nation's own revolutionary memory. Boston's demographics were changing, and some people in South Boston worried about their own claim on American identity. Consider that, in 1934, South Boston's Irish political machine gerrymandered Roxbury's Ward 9 just to break up a concentration of black voters. So, McCormick certainly may have been um, interested in the revolution, but what we find out is that his motivations for getting the MPS into Boston likely had as much to do with his own political moment, uh, concerns of his Irish-American family and neighbors, and most certainly anxieties about race and power uh, that have figured in every facet of Boston's story uh, really since the beginning of uh, its history. It was McCormick's campaign that blazed the second path to authorization, uh, and that was the Boston National Historic Sites Commission. This was the federal commission charged with figuring out how to create uh, a National Historical Park in Boston. The commission began its work in 1955, uh, and it submitted its final report to Congress in 1961. That report was hugely significant uh, because it created a rough plan uh, for the park uh, as we know it today. Uh, and really, in many ways, uh, determines what the park is all about. So, who made that report, uh, and what's in it? The commission consisted of seven people. There were two politicians, Senator Levert Saltonstall and Representative Tip O'Neill. Director uh, Conrad Worth represented the National Park Service. The regional director, uh, Dan Tobin, more typically sat in for him. The other four were presidential appointments. They included uh, the noted preservationist Louise Crowninshield, Boston attorney John Sullivan, uh, there's Charles Watkins, who back then was president uh, of the Old North Lamp League, uh, and finally, as chair of the commission, was plastics and textile magnate Mark Bortman. Bortman's an interesting character. He had many points of contact uh, with Boston's heritage landscape. Uh, but most importantly, he led the Chamber of Commerce's Committee on Historic Places. There's a lot to say about this commission. Um, not much of it is good uh, so far as concerns history making. Uh, you can find the details in the administrative history, uh, but suffice it to say that those of its members who attended the meetings uh, were generally combative, unfocused. Uh, Crown and Shield recalled how uh, and I quote, uh, the Irish politicians voted me down every time. <laughs> uh, you know, the committee was so unproductive, in fact, that it had to hire a chief of party uh, to keep it on track. And the person uh, that they hired to do that was none other than Edwin Small, who, as we've seen, had been thinking about the shape of a national park in Boston uh, ever since the 1930s. In fact, years later, uh, Small recalled that it was him who actually did all of the commission's work. Those are his words. Uh, and when we read its final report then, uh, we are mostly reading what Edwin Small thought a national park in Boston should be. And if Small's background is any indication, he very much believed uh, that national parks should, when planned for cities like Boston, uh, be active partners in urban renewal. Urban renewal, uh, for our purposes, refers to the various strategies uh, used by American cities since the 1930s to encourage economic growth, 
by removing so-called uh, decay, what people back then called slum removal. Central to those strategies was the use of public-private partnerships to fund uh, demolition of old roads and buildings uh, and the construction of new ones. The idea was that by creating new modern urban landscapes, Americans would want to live and shop in cities, uh, thereby sparking economic growth. There's only one way that the West End could have gone, and it was down. The people there were getting poorer, the uh, tenements there were falling down, the fire hazard was increasing. There was only, and there's only one way you can cure a place like the West End, and that is to wipe it out. It's a, a cancer in the long run on the community. This may seem ruthless, but this is an aspect of urban renewal. And it's true that in many cases, urban renewal did breathe new life into old cities. It did so, however, primarily for people who already had access to privilege. Uh, black people and immigrants, uh, you know, they suffered tremendously uh, during this period from forced displacement uh, and the rupture of long-standing uh, community networks. In Boston, uh, by the late 1960s, in fact, urban renewal had displaced over 10,000 families and about one-third of those were families of color. Small had become a proponent of urban renewal uh, during the late 1930s when he worked as superintendent uh, of Salem National Historic Site. Conrad Wirth was also a champion of urban renewal. Um, urban renewal made sense to Wirth who was the architect of the agency's uh, post-war Mission 66 program, uh, you know, because he too believed that public partnerships with private capital uh, would keep the NPS alive. Daniel Tobin believed it too. Uh, at one meeting, in fact, uh, Tobin noted that serving tourists at Faneuil Hall uh, was, and, and these are his words, a matter of business and a matter of good citizenship, an investment, as he put it, in citizen redevelopment. And of course, the man chosen to chair the Boston National Historic Site Commission, uh, Mark Bortman, was deeply engaged with urban renewal uh, by virtue of his membership in Boston's Chamber of Commerce. Bortman wanted desperately uh, for the new national park to bring new business to Boston uh, by way of heritage tourism. He knew that it could because the chamber, uh, which he represented, had been a leading sponsor of Boston's newest history attraction, the Freedom Trail. The Freedom Trail uh, was really an instant success when it debuted back in 1951, and it quickly became a favorite reference uh, for banks and restaurants and all kinds of other businesses uh, that featured it in their advertisements. And that way, the Freedom Trail was itself very much a tool of urban renewal. It was a way to get white, uh, middle and upper class tourists to visit downtown and spend their money while there. So it was urban renewal then, by way of the Freedom Trail, uh, that really inspired the people who'd been chosen to imagine what a national historical park in Boston should be. Their ideas about history, about race, about profit, all impact how history gets done along the Freedom Trail and to this day, how it gets done in the park. By the 1960s, the MPS had followed two paths uh, toward creating a national historical park in Boston. McCormick had laid out the first with his Dorchester Heights scheme, uh, and then the Boston National Historic Sites Commission set down a second path uh, with Edwin Small's report. It was that plan that became the focus of a legislative campaign by Tip O'Neill and Ted Kennedy uh, to make the park a reality in Boston. Now, they hadn't made much progress when two bits of news suddenly sent the whole park planning process 
uh, down yet another path toward authorization. First, it was in 1968 that Bostonians learned that the federal government would shut down its historic naval shipyard in Charlestown. Second, just two years later, news spread that Boston had lost its bid to host the nation's upcoming bicentennial celebration. Now, though seemingly unrelated, these two events were bound up in Boston with all kinds of fears about the economy. Urban renewal, it turns out, had not really ended up being the cure-all that its boosters uh, had hoped for. Uh, and what's more, the onset of post-war deindustrialization uh, created a job crisis, typified and intensified by the looming shutdown uh, in Charlestown. So, faced with these twin dilemmas, the Boston Redevelopment Authority floated a plan. Why not create a bicentennial-themed National Historical Park, uh, and I'm quoting now, with a Naval Marine Museum on the site of Charlestown Navy Yard. The Boston Globe loved this. Uh, it predicted that a new national park uh, that included the Navy Yard would, quote, uh, be an enormous fillip to Boston's Freedom Trail. Everyone, in fact, seemed to love the new plan, uh, especially because it promised to create new jobs and create the infrastructure needed to capitalize on tourist dollars uh, during the uh, bicentennial. Everyone loved the idea, that is, except the National Park Service. The NPS, of course, had never considered the possibility of including a 19th century Navy Yard in a park dedicated to the Revolution. Um, a few preliminary studies predicted exorbitant costs to do it, and nobody with any agency believed that anything productive could be done with the Navy Yard in time for the Bicentennial. And yet, political pressures mounted. Kennedy went ahead and drafted the legislation for this new park concept. Um, you know, the Park Service, however, held its ground. And in its official report, the Department of Interior opposed the legislation. It was really an incredible moment. After 30 years of advocating for a national park in Boston, the NPS now found itself in the position of having to prevent that park from getting made. Um, as one of its representatives uh, explained to Congress uh, during the hearings, uh, and I quote here, what we are doing is unfairly raising expectations in the minds of the citizens of Boston that we can't fulfill. The appeal fell on deaf ears. On October 1st, 1974, Congress authorized establishment of the Boston National Historical Park, encompassing sites relevant to the revolutionary past in downtown Boston and significant portions of the old Charlestown Navy Yard. The Navy Yard got its own budget line, but with $8 million less than what the NPS estimated would be necessary to get the site up and running in time for the bicentennial. So, what do we learn from this administrative history? What use is there in doing all the work we have to do in order to understand these three paths to authorization? We might as well ask, what is the purpose of public history? Doing public history is not just about disseminating information. Public history, when it's done well, it's about using our understanding of the past to encourage a kind of critical self-awareness. We study the past so that we can understand how decisions made for us long ago condition our possibilities and our limitations today. Consider uh, that none of the park's three paths to authorization had much of anything to do with the history of the American Revolution. On the contrary, the history of this park is rooted most deeply in the politics of race and ethnicity, efforts during the 20th century to reinvent cities, and the economics of American nationalism after World War II. 
In other words, though the park's authorizing legislation nods toward, uh, as it terms it, the American Revolution and the founding and growth of the United States, Congress's intent in making this park was to encourage economic prosperity, the kind of prosperity that back then and today disproportionately favors white Americans. And it was that choice by the park's progenitors that, until reckoned with, will always limit the park's ability to serve all Americans. The good news is that um, in Boston today, you know, there's a whole new generation of grassroots history activists <clears throat> uh, that are showing us a new path forward. Consider for instance, uh, the Freedom Trail Foundation uh, and its tour guides who after years of contingent employment uh, are demanding uh, basic labor rights today. Uh, what they're demanding in essence is a reckoning with the history of Boston's post-industrial economy. Consider too uh, the redlined project. Uh, this is in Jamaica Plains uh, where the city life uh, Vida Urbana organization has set out uh, to lay bare the history of racist housing and loan policies that undergirded urban renewal uh, in Boston beginning uh, back during the 1930s. They show us how the history of redlining is also the history of the red line that we call the Freedom Trail. Uh, and of course, uh, consider the insistence by a whole spectrum uh, of activists uh, that Faneuil Hall be renamed. All of them went an honest encounter uh, with the history of race and power, uh, one that the NPS cannot deliver so long as Faneuil Hall remains, just as the Chamber of Commerce wanted it back during the 1950s. History upstairs, tourism dollars on the ground floor. People who haven't benefited from American prosperity during the last century, they know full well that racism and capitalism are in effect the same system. Until the NPS figures that out, there's little chance of breaking through all the barriers uh, that run through Faneuil Hall and well beyond into the rest of the park. My administrative history uh, is a roadmap for those of you who want to figure it out. I think it's an opportunity to create a new path, and I really do hope you all take it. All right. Thanks so much, and good luck.